welfare reform questions from a national level, um, you're, you're using the announcements to answer high-level policy questions. Um, the kinds of policies that are being implemented over the coming years are shown on the screen here. So um, over the next five years, you can see that there's a whole range of different policies being introduced. And generally, at a national level, the impact of these policies are often considered, they're modeled together, but they're considered in isolation. So, for example, you know, we tend to think about the personal tax allowance as being separate from perhaps changes to taxes and benefits, changes to the benefit system, um, or changes to the minimum wage. But actually, all of these things inter interact and interrelate in, in quite complex ways. When you drill all the way down to the individual level, uh, people aren't particularly interested in the impact of any particular policy. They're, impact on, on, they're interested in the impact of all of these policies combined on their, on their net income, on their take-home income. So what we wanted to do today was um, show you a little bit about how this level of complexity can be, can be distilled in a useful way for your residents. Kicking off with a national case study, as I mentioned, this is generally how we think about policy. Um, here at Policy Practice, we try and have an impact on the, the shape of policy. So we did some analysis recently, this is our most recent um, uh, headline just in, in April, where we looked at the impact of the two child limits tax credits on a national basis. Um, this is a rule whereby the third child born to low-income low -income families since April will no longer get, uh, that family will no longer receive tax credit support. Um, and what we calculated was that this change was going to affect 8,000 children a month. Um, and when you took that all the way through to the end of the Parliament as it was then, all the way through to 2020, and factored in the impact on the family, them and their siblings, it was not just the child that loses out, clearly the resources of the family will be shared across. We found that one million children uh, were going to be impacted by this, this change alone, all the way through to 2020. Um, and it's, it's quite powerful. Uh, Analysis, as you can see there by the Guardian headline, I'm actually speaking at the Scottish Parliament on this tomorrow. But what I wanted to do was focus on others who have done this type of national analysis too. Um, Janet and I were at the IWRB conference up in Leeds a little while ago, um, and one of the talks we heard was from Christina Beatty, who um, I know well. Um, her and her team at, and the team at Cresso have looked at the impact of welfare reforms combined using a different methodology to the one that policy and practice use. But I think some of the points she, she makes are very uh, very relevant, very pressing. So you've got on this slide, I guess the headline is £690 per year for every adult working age is what's being taken out through benefit reforms. Um, but I think the most telling, the, the, the bit that hit me the most, I think that, that, that struck attendees at the IWRB the most, is that the worst is yet to come. For those who are most severely hit, namely low-income families with children, um, it really was a call to get um, to get low to get families to um, plan ahead um, to get low, yeah to get local authorities to plan ahead. Um, so it's a really a call to action to say the impact of past reforms have been absorbed. Now we're getting to the tipping point, and because a lot of these reforms are having a cumulative impact. Um, it's really, it's really now and in the coming years that I think local authorities are going to see, uh, see how their residents are going to really respond and um, what the real impacts of these reforms are going to be, which I think we've all been fearing for some time. So having looked at that national analysis, the, the, the point, and, and I think as we move on to the regional, local, and household level analysis, is, as we show here, um, is to say that really the national level analysis is useful for, I suppose, government when it's making its broad, uh, broad policy decisions. But the regional level analysis is useful, but it's very relevant too because it helps, um, helps organizations to really benchmark what their local, how, how powerful their local policies will be. Um, at a local level, it helps local authorities and other organizations to make better strategic decisions about what resources they invest in when they're trying to get support to their residents. And at the household level, uh, this kind of data is useful from an operational perspective because it helps you to target exactly which households you want to speak to and, um, uh, and get the right kind of support to them, whether that's a text message for households that are pretty um, digitally aware um, or actually going to knock on the door because, you know, there's a, there's a really vulnerable household here who's about to be hit by a new reform. They perhaps just step into arrears for the first time. 
So before we move on, uh, before we move on, uh, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, it would be great to get your input on this. Um, Janet, do you want to step in and serve the poll? I can indeed. So um, the very first poll that we have for you this morning, uh, I think as you can see here on your screen, how do you currently assess the impact a policy change will have on your customers? Um, and I think this is a uh, single, single choice poll, so uh, you're going to have to choose one of these five options. Firstly, we don't carry out any type of analysis uh, at the moment. Secondly, I rely on information provided by the DWP and other government agencies. Thirdly, I use studies published by academics and think tanks, for example, the LGA. Fourthly, we carry out analysis and research in-house. And fifthly, we commission this work to third-party organizations. Thank you very much, everybody. As I'm talking, I can see that you're all voting away like, like billiards, so that's fantastic. I'll just leave it um, a couple more seconds. Very interesting for us to understand uh, as Devon says, we were talking with people last week, uh, a couple of weeks ago, at the IWRV in Leeds. Um, but it's always very interesting for us to uh, understand uh, how uh, you're doing it yourselves, um, because things change, uh, as we know. So thank you very much. I think I'm going to. I think I've given uh, most people enough time to vote. So what I'm going to do now uh, is close the poll and share the results with you. And then Devon and Giovanni may want to comment on that. Thank you. Okay, so very interesting results here. So, Devon, Giovanni, any uh, any thoughts on those answers? Janet, would you want to read out the poll results uh, briefly? Yes, I can indeed, of course. So, how do you currently assess the impact of policy change will have on your customers? Um, top of the list by a long chalk, 71% of you say uh, that we carry out the analysis and research in-house. Uh, that's that's a, a huge, a, a huge number. And then joint secondly at 12%, uh, we have people who say, I use the studies published by academics and think tanks, for example, the LGA. And also um, joint second, we commission this work to third party organizations. So way down the list in terms of uh, uh, the outlying um, results. And then there are also 6% of you who say that we don't carry out any type of analysis uh, at the moment. And interestingly, uh, if only for the fact that it's 0%, none of you uh, have chosen, uh, I rely on information provided by DWP and other government agencies. So the headline there, Devon, 71% of people carry out analysis and research in-house. Great. Um, well, I think, that's, I think that's really interesting. I take the last point on board as well about 0%. I'm sure that's not quite true. I, I, I'm, I'm sure people do look at um, government published reports, but I think um, sometimes recognize that that national policy effect isn't necessarily relevant to them at a local level, uh, which is probably why their own in-house analysis uh, and the teams they have there is so, are so important uh, to be able to answer the questions that are most important to them locally. It'd be great to understand what questions they're, they're answering um, through that too. Okay. <laughs> So I think I wanted to move on. Having discussed the national level analysis, I wanted to talk a bit about a regional case study. Um, this is a really powerful piece of work that we were very grateful to the Trust for London for, for, uh, for helping us to, for, for funding. What that's enabled us to do is bring together housing benefit data across 14 London boroughs together um, and track their circumstances, track income, employment, and poverty of these 443,000 households um, over two years. So that, I think that itself, so pulling together the data across 14 London boroughs is in itself quite an achievement. Um, the level of analysis we're going to be able to do with a much larger data set than looking at just one authority in isolation is I think very exciting for both myself and Giovanni. Um, what we've done is we're tracking these 443 households over multiple points in time, so on a monthly basis over two years. That means that to date, we're looking at 5.6 million records that we've collected um, from January 2016. All of this data is anonymized, of course, but it, it's, uh, it's pseudonymized, which means we can track individual households from one time period to the next. Uh, these, policies, these households, the policy scenarios across five different scenarios have been modeled. So that's um, April 2015, 16, 17, 
Also, the timing of this project is alongside the introduction of the benefit cap, so we're going to be looking in detail and providing an independent assessment of for households that were impacted by the benefit cap and what actually what was the causal effect that came from, from being affected by this policy. Did households move into work or did they move into temporary accommodation, which is something Giovanni is going to talk about in a second. And then also their circumstances through, uh, in 2020. So this is the ability to model using our policy modeling engine and software the circumstances um, that these households will, will see in 2020, as I showed on that early slide. Um, and just briefly, I think it's worth on mentioning, so that's of these 14 London boroughs, that catches 20% of the total working age population uh, in each of in these boroughs in total. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Giovanni now to actually talk through the analysis. Yeah. And to you, Giovanni. I hope you can hear me uh, well and clear. Um, so just a quick introduction to sort of the slides and the findings I'm going to present. This is the first wave of analysis that we've conducted on this project, which, as Devin mentioned, will carry on up until the first few months of uh, 2018, a hugely exciting pro uh, project, which has sort of two, three main aims. Uh, sort of the first one is to really by pulling this data together and uh, looking at the regional dimension, try to understand how certain dynamics and certain trends um, regarding the impact of welfare reform in London uh, relate uh, and differ uh, among and between uh, um, different boroughs. Um, the second aim is really to benchmark uh, uh, sort of the some of the findings across the different boroughs, and that that I'm, I'm sure. Uh, many of you will find very interesting as it really uh, gives an indication of how things things change and what can be done in each local authority in order to improve the way support is delivered and also to understand some of the uh, um, sort of specific and peculiar trends that characterize each local authority. And finally, uh, the last thing is really to promote this type of exercise in terms of sharing this information at a much uh, um, larger context engaging also with uh, the uh, Greater London Authority and the DWP to promote the smart use of data on a larger scale. Uh, so the findings that I'm going to present are structured in two main ways. First of all, I'm going to uh, sort of describe what the current uh, baseline situation is as of January 2017, both in terms of the impact of welfare reforms and in terms of the living standards and sort of the poverty picture in uh, across these 14 London boroughs. And then I'm quickly going to do a demonstration on a, uh, sort of an interactive visual that allow us to track how circumstances have changed uh, among uh, these 400,000 households over the course of 12 months. So let's start. Um, for those who, of you who aren't familiar with the work we're doing, just a very quick intro to our approach. We use housing benefit and council tax supports data, which is a, a gold mine of information at the household level, which each single local authority in the country is in possess of. And uh, we combine the richness of this information with our modeling software, uh, which models the current system in universal credit side by side, but also models different policy scenarios in the future. And that really is a very detailed uh, um, picture of sort of the living standard of each single individual household. Um, and again, this is just to show how our approach really makes us stand out of the pack as uh, precisely this household level approach allows us to understand how many policies affect one single person as opposed to other type of analysis, which, for example, government uh, impact assessment, which focus on what, how one single policy affects many people. And you can understand that the implication of this shift uh, um, are, are, are quite huge. But let's jump on to uh, let's jump on to the findings. So the, as I said, uh, the analysis has been carried out on data collected at the end of January 2017. That's when the uh, lowest benefit cap was almost fully rolled out across the whole of London and uh, also across the whole of the country. Um, there are a few borrows which uh, um, for, uh, on which the rollout took a bit longer. Uh, but for the majority of them, so the majority of the borrowers participating already saw the, the increasing caseload of cats affected by them. So I think that timing naturally 
brought us naturally to look back and try to assess what the cumulative impact of welfare reform had been on uh, these 400,000 uh, households. And I think sort of the, 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 the first very interesting headline is that um, over uh, 270,000 households have been impacted by at least one reform. Uh, that's 62 of the over 62 percent of the overall cohort, and if we are restricted to uh, uh, just a working age cohort, that's uh, over 80 percent. The majority of them have been affected only uh, perhaps by uh, reduction in council tax support, which um, is you know relative to other reforms as it is it has a, a, a low impact on average three pounds and ninety pence. But uh, almost a third of, of, of these households have, uh, been, have been affected by either one or more of the other major reforms that uh, um, reduce the housing benefit entitlement. So either the under occupation charge, the LHA cap applied to the uh, private rented sectors or the benefit cap. Um, and uh, here we have also the, the, the list of the three boroughs most heavily impacted and uh, affected by the cap. And we have um, the borough of London borough Enfield with uh, over a thousand households, Hackney with just below, just under uh, a thousand households, and then Lambeth. Uh, I think because of the timing of the rollout, uh, Tower Hamlets and Brent, which are both participating in the project, and uh, they were expecting a large uh, case of houses cap, weren't uh, showing as many household cap as they currently have because the rollout was delayed in, in these two local authorities. Um, so this so this is sort of the picture at, uh, at the overall level, over 400,000 households. But then when we start benchmarking uh, the impact of welfare reform across the 14 uh, different local society, this is the picture that emerges. So um, in this graph, the red bars indicate the number of households that are highly impacted by welfare reform, which uh, we uh, classify as losing 30 pounds or more per week as a result of, um, of this reform, whereas the blue bar uh, shows the average weekly loss across uh, all households affected within the borough. Uh, again, Enfield, Brent and Haringey, sort of the outer boroughs, um, uh, seems to show the number of houses, uh, uh, the number, the highest number of houses highly impacted, uh, whereas in terms of the average impact, these changes so Harrow and Hammersmith and Fulham are the two local authority with the highest average impact. I think uh, when we presented this in front of uh, the 14 bars just a week ago, what was interesting is that um, it, it felt like this information would be very useful for them to make a case, for example, to the DWP for more funding as, as sort of the prevailing argument is that uh, currently outer London boroughs are, are disproportionately affected um, and this, uh, by welfare reform, but perhaps uh, this is not necessarily reflected in the level, for example, of uh, in incremental DHP uh, that they received. And I think uh, this shows the power of of, uh, of this analysis and the power of benchmarking uh, uh, some of this finding at the regional level. And especially the other you know, if we've got if this is a national webinar, we've got people from all over the UK, uh, councils across the UK, and other organisations across the UK on this webinar. And I think the relevance here is, imagine if you could benchmark um, basically the level of impact you face versus other similar councils um, and boroughs. I think that, that is the kind of information that you would find helpful in determining basically which strategies are going to be most effective for your local authority. I'm making in that case for funding, as Giovanni said. Yes, so the, the follow on, the natural follow on question from this analysis is what impact did or does or this, uh, the, the changes to the, the welfare landscape have on living standards and on the poverty, the picture around poverty uh, in the capital. And when, when we try to answer that question, we realize that first of all, we needed to uh, decide on how to measure living standards and economic deprivation. And uh, uh, we really see, we saw two different ways. Sort of the, the, the most common and most classical way, which is uh, uh, use the relative poverty measure, which is measured as 60% of the median income. And uh, uh, sort of this approach has its, uh, its own advantages. So uh, it's simple and it's a simple and established measure. 
it provides an homogenous benchmark across uh, both locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. And in terms of strategic policy objectives, uh, it's, 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 it's useful because it is set an objective, a, a, simple and, um, a, a simple objective that uh, uh, sort of the uh, success of policy can be measured like this. However, uh, it comes with uh, a set of disadvantages. So um, because it starts from measuring the household income, it doesn't really take into account the um, cost that each household face. Uh, and, it, and at the same time, it doesn't describe how uh, households are coping. And this is particularly relevant when we consider a household circumstance, sort of the household circumstances within the context of changes into their benefits entitlement. Um, and it also has limited operational implication. I mean, it would be interesting to hear uh, your take on this, but, uh, uh, but when it comes to deciding who to target support to on the front line, perhaps understanding who lives below, you know, an arbitrary, uh, below or above an arbitrarily set uh, uh, poverty measure doesn't necessarily help in determining uh, your, your operational decisions. So we've come up at Policy and Practice uh, actually working in close relationship with the London Borough with a second uh, indicator of economic deprivation, what we call the financial risk indicator, which measures income versus needs. Uh, and the needs here are described by the household costs. So these are the costs that are modeled, they're assumed costs, but we use the OMS uh, um, e uh, family economic survey, we use the uh, bottom third decile and adjust to the size of the household to estimate what uh, 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 sort of the basic monthly cost that each household faces. We then compare that against what the uh, household income is and we uh, derive this information from sort of the data that is captured in the, uh, the housing benefit uh, extract and we determine whether a household is at high financial risk or not. So this approach um, is capable of capturing a household's needs. It um, really provides a close estimate of the family's real financial circumstances, whether they're in crisis or not. And it's, uh, uh, it's got a highly operational insight because it really allows you to flag which households are in crisis and might struggle to meet their uh, um, monthly obligations. The disadvantage that is fairly complex to model, it needs to be done at the household level. And uh, the parameters can be tweaked, so it, it's perhaps harder to enforce consistently at a larger scale. And just to give you a, note, a, a live example of how uh, uh, sort of these two sets of parameters apply to the same power differ is uh, sort of this table here, which really captures the, 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 a picture around living standards in the cohort in London we were talking about uh, by sort of the two indicators. On the left hand side, the column on the left hand side provides information on those houses in relative poverty. Uh, the middle column uh, provides information on those houses that we identify as financial risk, which means houses whose income is lower than their modeled cost. And finally, the column on the right hand side uh, provide some the information on the overall power. I think I highlighted a, a, a few indicators here. First of all, um, the total number of houses at risk within this cohort is larger than the total houses living in relative poverty, which is already in itself, I think, quite an interesting finding. Um, the percentage of houses in work is greater among uh, um, houses at financial risk. And um, the average rent faced by households at financial risk is higher, and this is what we expected as this indicator starts per precisely from capturing the household's cost. So there's a big difference, uh, as you can see, almost a 300 pounds different in the average rent faced by these two groups. But I, th I think the, the most uh, telling of all findings is uh, uh, related to the households that uh, are highly impacted by welfare reform. So the proportion of households highly impacted by welfare reform in relative poverty versus the one at financial risk. This is almost three times as large, um, 19% versus 6%. And I think the conclusion that can be drawn from here is that was it, when we're looking at the impact that welfare reform has on uh, living standards, perhaps if we solely look at the sort of classic way, at the relative poverty way, 
we probably would find no correlation between an increase in poverty and the effect of welfare reform, whereas this, this correlation emerges quite clearly when we actually look at the level of financial risk that these households face. So I guess the argument there is that the final risk, financial risk measure is probably a stronger indicator of need. Yeah. Um, another interesting part of the analysis here, we mapped the, the sort of the, the, the two indicators on, on, a, on a map and uh, we show we show this by borough. Uh, here you can see that, for example, Hackney and Anfield, uh, which are, for those of you who are not familiar with it on the map, uh, the top borough and, and, and borough sort of in the middle on, on the right hand side, show the highest percentage of economic deprivation under both measure. However, there are other three uh, London boroughs, Amherst, Mason, Fulham, Lambeth, and Camden, who show the uh, higher percentage of people at financial risk than uh, household living in poverty. Um, and again, drilling down further, we look at this at a world level, so uh, how sort of the, economic, the level of economic deprivation and poverty for each London, uh, London borough participating at the world level. And I think the takeaway point here is that while uh, certain boroughs in the previous slide looked relatively uh, safe in terms of uh, economic risk and, and, and poverty risk, there are some um, uh, sack of deprivations that emerge when looking at this information in a more granular way. I think again this makes the argument for uh, uh, really trying to uh, uh, focus the, the analysis at a much localized and, and granular level. This takes us to the second sort of uh, uh, main section of the findings, uh, which is uh, the, it, w w which it consisted of basically tracking sort of how the circumstances of uh, this cohort of household house have changed over time. Here in this slide, I just put some sort of uh, general information that is quite interesting. Uh, so the 12 months worth of data that we collected uh, allowed us to track changes in circumstances of each single individual household. In January 2016, um, we, um, the, we captured 452,000 households in, in the cohort. Um, around 67,000 households have since left the data set, so they've either moved off benefits They've either moved on to universal credit, that's particularly true for areas that are full service, uh, or, or they simply moved out of London or, or moved into one of the boroughs that are not participating. In the meanwhile, um, 58,000 houses have joined the data set, so there's been almost quite an equal rebalancing, so that now, well, as of January 2017, there was uh, 443,000 households. Um, one of the main aspects, sort of one of the key uh, uh, issues that, that was uh, of interest for local authorities, and, and I think it's interesting not just in London, but at the national level, is tracking those individuals that um, perhaps end up in temporary accommodation. So the houses, so those how, how housing circumstances of family change uh, over the course over over the course of the years and. I'm just going to pull out of the uh, presentation to um, give a demonstration of an interactive visual tool. So this is a uh, this is a live presentation of what's going on with those 452,000 households uh, at different points in time. Uh, it being a live demonstration it takes a second or two to load, uh, and there's I mentioned before 452,000 households and 5.6 million individual data points underlying this analysis. I imagine as well the fact that we're on a webinar at the same time it means it's taking a little longer to communicate to the server. Uh, 
So this is a, um, a this is just a, a demonstration of the tool that we developed for Croydon and shows, for example, we want to understand all those households that have ended up in temporary accommodation. Um, so as you can see, we're showing uh, each single individual, each single individual that corresponds to a household and uh, matched within the borough. There's 35,000 households uh, uh, showing here. Uh, and as I said, we're interested in those households that have ended up in temporary accommodation to understand uh, uh, some of the characteristics around it and what can be done in order to uh, um, improve the way support is delivered to them. Sort of now the the tool has uh, um, a drilled down to 1,388 households. Um, we want to now, from a local authority perspective, we want to understand all those households that are uh, at high financial risk. So we can filter this down further. This leaves us with 300 households on the map. And of those that uh, are high financial risk uh, and are uh, perhaps struggling to uh, pay their rents, uh, we want to understand how many in the past year have uh, received, have been awarded a discretionary uh, payments, a discretionary housing payment. So we can filter this down further um, to just show the one. As you can see, this is just one household. So out of, I'm gonna drill back. So out of the 297 houses at temporary, in temporary accommodation, uh, that ended up in temporary accommodation in the past year, and that are now at a uh, high financial risk, only one household uh, has been uh, awarded discretionary uh, housing payment, showing that um, perhaps, showing that the, um, uh, but the resources that the council have uh, allocated, well, I'm sure that the council could have uh, allocated these resources in a different way. So I guess the point there is, what could have happened differently if more of those households, if the council had been aware that more of those households, if they had received a DHP, could they have avoided uh, ending up in temporary accommodation? So you'll see now that the, uh, the, the, the wider, uh, the longitudinal analysis chart is showing, uh, well, this looks at tenure and movements into tenure. I think what I wanted to show, what we were going to show here, was um, households that ended up in temporary accommodation. So I selected temporary accommodation. We're just going to look at those that ended up in temporary accommodation. You can also use this kind of analysis to compare things like um, groups of households in council tenancies versus other social tenants. Uh, a council we speak to were very keen on using that to benchmark their own performance. Now, if we look at those, just those that ended up in temporary accommodation. So I'm just going to exclude those that yeah. started off in temporary accommodation. Uh, I'll hand back over to Giovanni now to talk through what this is telling you. Yeah. Well, first of all, if we go back, uh, 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 I think the, one of the most interesting aspects of this, it was showing that 82% of the houses that ended up in temporary accommodation, well, that are currently in temporary accommodation, have been in temporary accommodation for over 12 months. Of the remaining 12%, 18% that have moved into temporary accommodation over the course of the last 12 months, 72% uh, have moved in from sort of the, the private rent sector, i.e. they probably lost their tenancy. And um, we can now focus, we can now drill down on uh, uh, who these houses, to understand who these houses are. Hard. And as you can see now, uh, um, this screen maps sort of uh, uh, these houses across the different boroughs. So Enfield, uh, which is the northern borough, uh, and Croydon are those, house, uh, are those boroughs with the highest number of houses moving in TA in the, over the uh, course of the last 12 months. Um, 
And interesting, um, we can see that in terms of the economic circumstances, over half of all the, ha the houses, over a thousand of uh, 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 the houses that have moved into temporary accommodation are actually in work. 5% uh, uh, of them, over 150, are affected by the lower benefit cap. And I think this uh, really brings in a, quite an interesting point. It would be uh, th there's definitely a, a correlation that emerges here between uh, being affected by the benefit cap and um, living in temporary accommodation. What isn't clear at this stage is whether is perhaps the benefit is being affected by the benefit cap to begin with. Uh, that uh, um, uh, triggers households to move into temporary accommodation, or is households that live in temporary accommodation, i.e. face high financial costs, and there is a slab of this, are then uh, kept. And some of, we will try to answer uh, this question as we move ahead and we proceed further uh, with analysis and as we gather more data uh, in the coming months. So that's exactly the type of question. So what if you're impacted by low benefit cap, is that driving you to be in temporary accommodation? Or is the fact that you're in temporary accommodation in the first place causing you to be impacted by the benefit cap because of your higher housing costs? Um, and we'll be looking at that over the coming uh, period. Back to the presentation. So this leads me to some, some uh, concluding remarks. Um, over the first uh, wave of analysis. Uh, first of all, sort of aggregate statistics and KPIs overshadow the, the complexity of the dynamics that affects the pockets and prospects of low-income households, uh, uh, sort of advocating for a, a more granular type of analysis. But the, second, the second remark is about benchmarking. So benchmarking performance with your peers is a powerful way to shape your regional anti-poverty strategy toward uh, what is most effective, as we've seen, and also to uh, support some of your uh, engagement with, for example, national government in, in, in terms of funding. Um, Understanding the impact of welfare reform and changes in employment and uh, housing can be useful for the predictor of risk and crisis, allowing you to act preemptively. And I think this is um, precisely what we'll be aiming to do. I turn uh, sort of the historical data uh, into a predictive uh, analysis. And finally, uh, uh, going back to the message with which we started the, uh, uh, the, this webinar is that wealth reform will continue to impact a large number of families. We have shown that through our specific uh, measure of poverty, it's possible to target supports to your household most to identify the houses that are most in crisis and to target supports to uh, those most likely to be uh, facing financial crisis in the future. Over to you, Devin. Thanks a lot, Giovanni. Hopefully that was, um, a, that was a very interesting demonstration. I wanted to move on to the, the hyper-local. So um, at, at that point, Giovanni just made about turning the, the backward-looking historical data into forward-looking and predictive analysis. So it's worthwhile touching on the case study that we worked on recently with Winchester and we're about to build upon. So we worked with Winchester to help them to identify households who are going to be impacted by the benefit cap. Um, what we've just agreed with them and, and the project that they're running right now, um, so what Winchester wants to do is to track the, the effectiveness of a new type of financial support going to their tenants. The driver of this is that they are a landlord themselves. They are concerned about what the impact will be on their uh, of universal credit on their tenants' ability to pay their rent. And they want to get ahead of the game. So before universal credit comes in, they want to be able to um, make sure that the tenants that will need support when they move on to universal credit effectively already have it through this new type of payment account. Um, so they're gonna test this new financial product to help families improve their budgeting skills, um, help ensure that they are reducing or controlling their arrears, um, and fundamentally to do all of this ahead of universal credit. The question they had was, how would they know that this was effective? cost effective too. So what they did, uh, what they're doing right now is identify uh, among their tenants two groups of 100 high risk households who are in, currently in receipt of housing benefits and are living in council, council tenancies. 
one of these will be a trial group who will receive a new type of intervention, and one of these will be a control group. So the groups are going to be, uh, the sampling of the groups will be selected um, through a, uh, an independent uh, research project um, that the University of Southampton is collaborating with them on. But our work effectively is to, is to drill down from their uh, thousands of thousands of council tenants to identify those um, those few that will that are most likely to benefit from this type of intervention. So to identify effectively the hundreds of households from which this this sample group will be uh, selected, who are most likely to benefit and most likely to need a uh, type of financial intervention as they move on to universal credit. And we're also going to be tracking objectively um, the income, employment, arrears situation of each one of these groups before and after the trial. Uh, so you can, you can see how effective that is. And I think it's worthwhile just reflecting. So for those of you on this call, if you, are, if you have an intervention planned or if you've been running interventions to support your residents who are impacted by welfare reform, imagine if everyone on this webinar actually evaluated the effect that that intervention was having. If they were able to do that and then learn from each other and effectively through a data-led approach, determine what approaches were most effective, we might be seeing a, a better adoption of, of best practice approaches or tailoring of what's working well in one area to your local area a bit more effectively. And that's really what um, I think we've been building toward uh, in the analysis that Giovanni shared with you. So the tool that he shared with you is designed to give you visibility over groups of households you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. So for example, households who perhaps if they had a third child in the future might be, a, might be particularly at financial risk or households who are currently on tax credits um, in, work, in work poverty effectively, who don't really have a reason to engage with the council day to day, but might be heavily impacted by welfare reform as Giovanni showed you in that demonstration. It helps you to identify trends so you can see what's happening at a regional, your local authority and at a ward level. So you can get resources and the right kinds of resources to the right areas locally. Um, it can help you to fundamentally track and forecast future need. So you can look backwards to look forwards. Effectively look at what's happened historically um, to adapt your, your practices and perhaps intervene with households at an earlier stage. Um, and the fact that it's an online dashboard and an online tool allows you to make data which can sometimes be limited to analyst teams or, or just to those people who are very comfortable with Excel. Uh, it makes it much more accessible because the user interface um, and the structures behind it are made accessible to different individuals and different teams, even right down to the operational level. So that drives the poll here. Janet, can I hand back to you to run this poll? The question is, for, for, for us, having um, developed the Low Income Family Tracker, uh, the Lyft dashboard, is to understand where, where you guys would use it. Janet, can I hand back to you to run the poll? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Devon. So yes, as Devon says, uh, the question for poll two is, what would you use the Lyft dashboard for if you had it in your organization? So please select all of the answers that apply to you. Uh, there are five options here. You can choose all five if you like, uh, or you can just choose one. Um, so the options are, would you identify at-risk households? Would you track the impact of interventions on your residents? Would you target your support more effectively? Would you forecast your future need uh, and take, prevented, take a preventative approach? Um, or, and or would you access your data insights in a click. Thank you very much, everybody who is voting. I can see um, that you're uh, clicking away as I speak. That's brilliant. I'll just give you a little bit more time to make your decision. As I say, do choose as many um, as possible. And uh, for those who haven't yet, you can see the download for more information uh, about the Lyft dashboard. There is a, a download available in the panel on the right-hand side as well. Excellent. Thank you. I shall leave it there. I'll close the poll and then I will share the results with you. 
Brilliant. Okay, how very interesting. So, what would you use the Lyft dashboard for? Multiple answers allowed. Top of the list, 94% of you uh, would target support more effectively. Uh, some very high numbers here. Jointly then, at 71%, uh, you would identify at-risk households and you would forecast future need and take a preventative approach. Uh, then next on the list, at 65%, uh, many of you would track the impact of interventions, your interventions on your residents to see uh, what's working and how well. And then finally, at 41%, uh, you would access your data insights in a click. Very interesting results. So the headline figure there, Devon, is 94% of people would uh, use the dashboard to target their support more effectively. Uh, and 71% jointly would identify at-risk households and forecast future need and take a preventative approach. Yeah, uh, well, I think they were all pretty high, is the thing I would take away from it. Um, it's quite interesting because what's really useful, so thank you for everyone who participated in the poll, is it helps us to think about how we develop the services we move forward and how we um, uh, focus on what, what you guys are finding most, most useful and relevant. I think what's powerful about the way we've built the, built the Lyft dashboard is it's the kind of tool that any local authority can adopt because the data set it's built on the housing benefit data is is standardized um, and by working together so uh, we work we've worked with over 40 local authorities um, to get to this point is that as one local authority adopts it uh, and builds upon it other local authorities can then benefit so if we're developing the ability to track households as we are with Winchester um, from one time period to the next that's the kind of service that other local authorities can then automatically benefit from I think there is a there is a um, one thing that's in the background for for some of you. It often comes up in conversation, which is okay. Well, that's built around housing benefit data. What happens is universal credit comes in. And I think there are a few very relevant and powerful answers to that. One is that local authorities will still have housing benefit for um, pensioners, and um, they'll also have access to the council tax support data. What we've been able to do is take council tax support data in uh, full service sites like Croydon and reverse engineer from those, those households that are on universal credit. And it's interesting just how much information we can learn from those, from those, uh, from those groups. Um, but clearly a big driver here is to um, make a case for accessing some of that universal credit data yourselves. Um, that's a big driver for policy and practice. It's one of uh, four or five very practical issues that we want to try and help resolve for local providers uh, and for the DWP uh, in this National Welfare Implementation Summit we've got planned for September 2017. We've had a number of conversations with DWP about it who are very keen on the idea of a constructive debate around the challenges that I think are shared at a national and a local level with a view to everyone getting in a room to solve problems. Um, so I just wanted to take the opportunity to flag this as an upcoming thing because it will be in the next steps. Um, and we've got about five or ten minutes left, I think, for questions before Janet moves on to the next step. So Janet, do you mind sharing any questions that have come through? Yes, I will do, De Devon. Thank you very much. So uh, everybody, please do send your questions in uh, if, you, if you've any, any questions that haven't been answered yet, or indeed you have any, uh, any questions on uh, the dashboard uh, you'd like us to go back to. Uh, but two questions that come up, Devon. Um, Timely enough, will the data uh, be rich enough to have the impact after full service universal credit rolls out um, was a question that came in. I know you were just talking there about universal credit and the, relief and the use of data. Yeah, I mean, briefly, I think there are three ways in which we're approaching the challenge of universal credit data. One is that because we're tracking households over time, we can see those households that move off of, you know, off of housing benefit in any given period from month to month or from quarter to quarter, that effectively gives uh, each authority we're working with a target list of those households who are, probably have moved on to universal credit or at least a large proportion of them have. So if they were your tenants, they might be the households you particularly want to actively reach out to um, because they, they probably have moved up housing benefits and moved on to universal credit. I think the second point there is the data that sits within council tax support, as I mentioned earlier, so you'll still have that. What we have seen is different variations in from different full service sites around the level of uptake of council tax support. 
So it's worth making sure that your local job center um, is, and the, the process whereby people are claiming for universal credit, they know that uh, they're able to point people towards making a counter tax support claim at the same time. Um, uh, and I think the third one is, as I mentioned, building that case for universal credit data to be shared more effectively in the future. Was there anything, Giovanni, you wanted to add to that? No, I think, I mean, from a technical point of view, I think the, we, we are seeing more and more, uh, you know, as the months go by, especially in, in life, in, in full service area, we're seeing more and more people that are flagged as on you see appearing in the council tax support data. And the information that is captured in, 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 in this data set is uh, as rich as the one captured in the house of the one. So um, there's some encouraging uh, statements on that. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, a second question, Devon and Giovanni, uh, about the uh, Lyft dashboard. Um, what teams, in your experience, what teams are finding this, uh, the dashboard, the level of information that's available? Who's finding it most useful uh, and what are they using it for? Um, I would say, I mean, really the last poll was to see what others who aren't using it for um, might want to use it for. I would say that, the, I mean, Giovanni can speak more, more clearly on this as he's been embedded in, in one or two of the local authority teams. But the, the things that I'm hearing uh, as being most valuable and most relevant is the ability to target support more effectively um, by identifying um, households that are both at risk, but also households where, and we didn't get into this in the presentation, where perhaps there's something specific you can do to help them. So I remember working with households impacted by the benefit cap and identifying those where there was a possible exemption, um, which again, when local authorities investigated, they found an exemption in a high proportion of those cases, which was an immediate quick win saving. Um, and I think drilling down, so the process we're getting through right now with our current plant is drilling down from the, I suppose, the work desk of having the data in front of you and being able to filter it all down to specific individual use cases that can be accessed by team leaders and people on the front line. Do you like yeah. So from my experience, I would say so, sort of um, teams that, I mean, depending from local authority to local authority, they sort of are tasked with the allocation of discretionary rights and payments, so whether that's uh, revenue, revenue and benefits or welfare support. Uh, so these teams really find it useful. Um, uh, the sort of housing teams, because we're able to um, um, match or integrate this data with data on arrears, for example, on rent arrears. So the housing teams can understand how level of arrears among their tenants differ, or sort of the financial circumstances of their tenants differ versus the, the, the ones of, of, for example, private rent sector tenants or other uh, uh, RSLS, uh, RSLS tenants. And then children's services increasingly are uh, uh, thinking of using dashboard because, of course, uh, uh, tracking low-income families just gives a, a clear picture of uh, also those children that are perhaps live in poverty or in families with uh, uh, high needs. So I think I would say these are the top three. Yeah, more than you are at risk in the yeah. near future from, from future welfare reports too. So again, helping them to take the next approach, which is a lot more effective. Thanks, Giovanni. Uh, is there anything else? I'm not sure how much time we have. I'm just conscious of the... Um, Yes, uh, Devin, you're quite right. We're up to 11.27 and I did promise everybody to be on their way by 11.30. So uh, I would urge anybody that's got any uh, any additional questions that we've not yet covered, um, there will be the uh, survey at the uh, end of the webinar. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. We've, we've done the, the, the questions. Okay, so I think that leaves me very nicely to move on to the next steps. Uh, as I just mentioned there, we have a very, very short three-question survey. Uh, we'd love your feedback um, on what you've heard presented today. Um, and there is an op and, and any questions for clarification or indeed uh, any other points that you want raised. Uh, we'd love to hear what you've got to say. Uh, equally, there is the opportunity for yourself to, and your colleagues to request a tailored demonstration. We really appreciate there's a, there's a lot in the dashboard uh, and um, Giovanni, 
And Devon, I've only really just covered the surface of what, what it can show you. Um, so we would urge you um, to request a tailored demonstration um, specifically for you and your organisation. Uh, and of course, along with that, um, you can get a, a quote as well. Um, the also, you can uh, request a copy of the Winchester City uh, Council case study that we talked about there. Um, and also, just to let you know as well, um, that we have another webinar um, coming up very shortly uh, in June, and that is going to be on our software that I mentioned way back at the very beginning uh, of the of the session. Um, that is going to be on our software in June. Um, so please do take a look at that uh, very short survey. We'd very much appreciate it. Um, and without further ado, Devon, Giovanni, do you have any final thoughts before we finish up? Just to thank everyone for joining us for the webinar, um, particularly for that second poll. We'll be, each one of those five features in that second poll we're working on, we'll be prioritizing those um, partly based on the results of the poll. Um, and if you'd like um, more information about that and, the, uh, and, and any of those features, then do, uh, do follow up with Janet directly, uh, hello at policyandpractice.co.uk or through the follow-up to this webinar. We look forward to hearing from you and hopefully working with you at some point soon. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we hope to chat again soon. Take care. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.